Hey there, this is Ari. Welcome back to the show. Before we get into today's episode, I want to let you know if you don't already know about our brand new supplement called Immune Genesis. This is, I truly believe, the absolute best, most powerful immune optimization supplement on the market. Now, of course, given everything that's going on in the world right now, everybody's interested in optimizing their immune function. So I, uh, as you may have noticed from my obsession uh, with what's going on in the world right now and all the podcasts I've, I've put out on that subject, all the experts that I've been talking to and interviewing, uh, this has become an obsession of mine. But in particular, I've become obsessed with what we can do about it, how we can optimize our own health and our own immune function to de decrease our risk of anything bad happening to us and of getting sick. So uh, I've put together this supplement with the help of many, many experts uh, in nutritional supplements, in immune function, uh, and I've really, I think, absolutely nailed it with this formula. Um, it's incredibly powerful. We're getting amazing testimonials from people, uh, and I highly encourage you to go check this out. You can get it at store.theenergyblueprint.com, and again, it's called Immune Genesis, and it is absolutely packed with over 10 ingredients with proven research showing that these compounds work to optimize immune function, work to reduce risk of respiratory infections or severity of symptoms of many common respiratory infections and things of that nature. So go check out the research. We've put it all on a page there for you so you can see for yourself um, what these ingredients have been shown to do in actual studies. Store.TheEnergyBlueprint.com and this formula is called Immune Genesis. Go check it out. Hey there, this is Ari. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. In this episode, I am talking to my friend, Dr. Kirk Gare, who is an expert in the subject of photobiomodulation using lasers, uh, specifically red and near-infrared light therapy in particular. This is, of course, also an area of expertise of mine, which you know if you've been following my work for a couple of years, you know that I've actually written what is regarded as pretty much the book on the subject outside of uh, medical textbooks for researchers and clinicians, uh, but a, a book actually on the subject of red and near-infrared light therapy for the, the, the lay person, you know, the average person who's looking to use it in their own home for, for themselves outside of a clinic. So one of the things I wanted to mention before I get into the show is um, Dr. Gare and I are really bringing different backgrounds into this discussion. Uh, he is, as I said, a clinician. He's on you know, the front lines of, of treating people, especially athletes with various kinds of injuries using these, these lasers in particular. And on the other hand, I've been really synthesizing and compiling the research on the subject of red and near infrared light therapy uh, for about a decade now, and not specifically on the topic of just lasers, which is what Dr. Gare specializes in, but on uh, all types of red and near infrared light therapy, the most common of which has now become LED based red and near infrared light therapy. So one of the things I wanted to mention here is it's important to be aware that the, the research that has studied this specifically where they've taken uh, you know, various groups of people and they've looked at studies using lasers and they've compared it to studies with, you know, similar groups of people for the same types of outcomes uh, using LED based red and near infrared light therapy is that those studies have concluded, the vast majority of them have concluded that uh, the effects are essentially the same, that there isn't anything particularly magical about using lasers, specifically that you get beyond uh, what you get from LED-based red and near-infrared light therapy. Having said that, this is a contentious issue because you have lots and lots of clinicians who specialize in using lasers that absolutely swear that you know lasers are doing all kinds of things that LED-based phototherapy devices cannot do or do not do. Um, so based, again, on the literature itself, the existing scientific literature, as we have uh, currently in 2021, uh, again, the evidence really doesn't indicate that lasers are doing anything differently in particular. But having said that, I will say some clinicians, including Dr. Gare, 
use lasers in very specific ways um, that are probably genuinely unique to lasers. Like they'll use them on very specific points to affect nerves and the nervous system uh, and to do nervous system re repatterning and things like that. And uh, the precision of lasers in those kinds of things uh, is probably extremely helpful in contrast to, let's say you've just got tendonitis and you wanna irradiate that whole area of your tricep tendon, or you wanna do an anti-aging skin treatment on your entire face, um, or you wanna treat sore muscles after a workout, you know, your, your quads or your back or your chest or something like that. These are scenarios where not only are lasers not likely to be superior, but lasers are likely to actually be inferior because they treat such a small uh, target area. So anyway, I, I, I don't want to go on and on for an hour with all the nuances of this, uh, but I did want to let you know some context around the science comparing lasers to LED-based red and near-infrared light therapy to kind of give you that context for this, this discussion that you're and this interview that you're about to hear from Dr. Gare. Uh, with all of that said, oh, one more thing I wanna mention. Uh, as I said, I've written the book on this subject. You can get it on Amazon. It's called The Ultimate Guide to Red Light Therapy. Highly, highly recommend getting that if you haven't already. It's got over 1500 reviews on Amazon. It's been a, a smashing success over the last couple of years since it was published. And uh, I've also got lots of free information on the website. If you do a Google search for uh, guide to red light therapy and energy blueprint. You, you'll you'll get our article that you can access for free on our website, which is basically a very very short version of a lot of the same information that's in the book, including uh, guidance on how to use red light therapy and which devices I recommend. So if you're watching the YouTube video, that link will be down below this video. If not, just again Google. Guide to Red Light Therapy, Ari Witten, or Guide to Red Light Therapy, Energy Blueprint, and you'll find it. And with all of that said, enjoy the show on this really amazing topic and uh, this amazing therapy that I highly recommend that you start using, red and near-infrared light therapy. Enjoy. So welcome to the show, Dr. Gare. Such a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Ari. I feel really uh, honored to be here that you'd have me as your guest. Uh, like I was saying beforehand, I'm especially excited because you have such a great knowledge of photobiomodulation already. So it's, it's exciting to share these things with you and with your audience and with such a great panel of experts. Uh, this is something that I think, especially with what we're going through right now with this pandemic, that people are looking for alternative methods and things that they can do to really you know, be proactive with their health and laser is one of the major things you can, you can do with that. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I got into this 16 years ago and uh, in 2004 and the doctors I learned from had been doing it since the eighties. So <clears throat> back then I felt like I was getting into it late. So it's just ironic that it's taken this long really for things to catch on. And thankfully people like you and, and other people sharing information on the internet, it's starting to raise the awareness of what lasers can do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what you got for us, my friend? What's the uh, the background that people need to know about photobiomodulation and about lasers specifically? Well, background, I think one of the important things to share with people that I'd like to start off with is that <clears throat> contrary to popular opinion is it's really not new. It goes back to the 1960s is when the research really started in it. And um, if you look at the research by the former Soviet Union, this is what really blew me away. And a lot of people aren't aware of it is that uh, by 1974, the Soviet Union had it as part of their state sponsored standard medical care, which just blew me away that they were that far ahead. And they were perplexed that <clears throat> in Europe and in the West that we didn't jump on it because of like like, this is obvious how well this worked. And uh, I'll show you one of my slides later where they actually were using it for all kinds of branches for everything from, from neurology to orthopedics to oncology to dentistry to immune function to using it to try to regenerate the thymus and the liver, just all kinds of things. So that was one of the big things I wanted to share with people that they weren't aware of. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, even going back further than that, the, 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 the yes. tradition of heliotherapy of, of using sunlight to treat disease goes back, I think at least a couple, well, I mean, thousands of years. The, yeah. Thousands of years. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. You know, more, more historically, but you know, sort yeah. of modern heliotherapy where it was kind of viewed as a scientific thing and it was a very conscious, yeah. like 
we're going to have heliotherapy clinics as I think about yeah. maybe 130 years old. Something yeah, like. back during what uh, Civil War, I think, is when they really started doing some things with that, noticing mm-hmm. some changes. Yeah. And then you had Niels Ryberg Finson in 1902. Was it three, I believe, 1903 or 1906, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for his research with blue light therapy versus uh, uh, lupus vulgaris, which is a tuberculosis infection of the skin that nothing was working for it, no medications were working. And he figured out using a 405 range nanometer uh, light actually knocked it out and he got a Nobel Prize in medicine and accommodation for the queen. Wow. Um, Pretty fascinating. Pretty Mm -hmm. fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah. So what I'd like to share then with you guys is when I first got started with with lasers in 2004, you know, it was, it was a really kind of emerging field and there wasn't a lot of, you you couldn't go on the internet and really find things about it. So I got my lasers and I brought them back to my clinic and that's where I kind of started tinkering with things. You know, I got into the science of how they worked and when I understood that they could dampen inflammation and stimulate glutathione and stimulate nitric oxide and stimulate stem cells, I thought, wow, there's really an unlimited amount of things that you could, um, you know, use this on. So my first laser miracle occurred in around 2004 when I had a girl come in who she was 16 years old, a high school student, and she had gotten injured on a homecoming float. She was in high heels and it was a flatbed truck. And the teacher thought it'd be funny to do the quick stop and start. And as he did this, her foot got caught and it rolled and she sprained her ankle. Thought it was no big deal. They go to Kaiser. Kaiser tells her, yeah, it's just an ankle sprain. You know, give it about four to six weeks, be on these crutches, do the rice method, you should be fine. Well, the four to six weeks pass and it turns into almost six months. And when she showed up at my clinic, she and her family said, one of the things that I hear a lot is people will show up and I feel like it's the scene from Star Wars with the Princess Leia, you know, hologram from R2-D2 saying, help us, Obi-Wan, you're our only hope. And that's pretty much what they said in my office because as they'd been at Children's Hospital of LA, their only uh, option for her because she had developed complex regional pain syndrome, which for those people who don't know what it is, it's where the nervous system is basically going haywire. And it's now light touch felt like someone was cutting her with razors. Her leg was cold from the mid thigh down. It was purplish red. Six months later, she was still on crutches. She came in with her pant leg cut off on the right because she couldn't handle the material on it. When she would sleep, she had to have her leg out. And they said that the only option that she was given by Children's Hospital was amputation. And could you imagine being 16 and being faced with amputation? I mean, yeah, just totally crazy. So they asked me, hey, do you think you can help? And I said, look, I don't know. I actually have her on my YouTube page sharing her story. And I said, I don't know. I said, I'm new with these lasers, but I know they can do some amazing regenerative things. Let's try it. You tell me if you think it works or not. So we got the laser on her and, and I would do some, I was just tinkering. I was trying to do some little light stimulation to her nervous system with like a cotton swab. And I I would try to do some different uh, movement therapies on her too while we had the laser. And the amazing thing was that within three weeks, she was back to normal. The blood flow was normal. Her temperature was normal. She could walk. She could do everything. The sad thing is when she went back to Children's Hospital and told them what she had done with lasers, do you think they gave it any value? Uh, I'm pretty sure they said, oh, that's nonsense. He just healed on its own. That was, just, that was a placebo. Yeah. They, they said uh, it was either a spontaneous healing or we misdiagnosed you. <laughs> uh, so they're going to cut her leg off on a misdiagnosis. So anyway, she became later on uh, worked for me. She was one of my receptionists. And so it was fantastic having her in there to share her story because, you know, people really saw how different things were. With yeah. Her. Receptionist slash salesperson. Oh, I definitely. I'm sure she was your biggest advocate at that point. Yeah, she absolutely was. She was my biggest one. And I, so I had a lot of studies like that. And I would do things with people that were going in, had surgery scheduled, we'd get laser on them, the tissue would heal. And there was actually one orthopedic surgeon in town who forbid his patients to see me before their surgeries because he had too many patients cancel uh, surgeries on him from the healings that they got. Mm-hmm. So it was pretty wild with that. And then, but still, you know, even as I'm using it, I'm still having that because uh, I, I always have a healthy dose of skepticism. So I'm always wondering, well, what if it is just a placebo? Because with a human, how do we prove that without, you know, a true double blind or quadruple blind clinical trials that are placebo controlled? So I had an interesting thing happen with my cat when he was 11. So we came home, my wife and I had had a good evening out and um, we come back home and you know, it, it, you have pets? Have you had pets? Sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dogs. If they get sick, do they do it during normal vet hours? 
Not usually. No, not usually. Yeah. So with, with ours, he never did. It was always after hours on the weekend. So uh, we come home, we find Poopsie lying down on the floor, limp and unresponsive. And it's like 11 o'clock on a Saturday. So we rush him into the emergency vet. They take a look at him like, wow, your cat looks pretty bad. Let's take him back. We're going to run some labs and do some imaging on him. So they run an ultrasound on his pancreas. They run the labs. They come back and they say, hey, look, we've got some really bad news for you. Your cat has acute necrotizing pancreatitis. We don't have a treatment for it. We recommend that you put him to sleep. And, you know, as an animal lover, that's a horrible thing that, to hear, right? You know, it's, you, you, oh, your only choice is to put him to sleep. So I'm in shock and I tell the doc, I said, listen, you know, I understand you don't have anything, but I'd like to take him home. I'm going to try doing some things with my lasers on him. And he kind of rolls his eyes thinking, here I am, the crazy chiropractor, going to use my voodoo lasers and think I'm going to do a miracle. And he said, listen, his, he, there's nothing that's going to work for him. Um, I don't recommend you do that. I said, well, look, I'm going to take him home. I'm going to try it. Said, what do I need to watch out for? He told me, you got to watch out for if he's yowling in pain or he doesn't have an appetite. He said, I figure by Wednesday, he's going to be in pain. You're going to have to bring him back and put him to sleep. Well, I lasered over his pancreas twice a day. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, laser won't go through the fur or it won't go through skin or through bone. But I'd seen these Russian studies. So I'm like, I'm desperate. I'm going to try it. So I'm lasering over his pancreas twice a day for about three minutes of time. By Wednesday, his appetite starts increasing. He starts moving around more. By Friday, he's doing great, and I take him in for a follow-up on Saturday. I bring him in. I set him down at the veterinary office, and he looks at him. He's like, whoa, wow, your cat looks surprisingly good. But hey, don't get your hopes up. We're going to take it back and do the imaging again. I expect you're going to see more destruction of his pancreas. He already had 90% destruction, so it's probably going to be worse. And at that point, you really need to put him to sleep. So I said, all right, fair enough. You know, I'll respect that. So he takes him back, and I can see him through the little hole in the, in the door there as he's, after he's got the uh, imaging up, and he's looking at the slide. He's scratching his head. He calls another doctor over. They're both arguing over it. And he looks back and he sees me and he waves me in. And so I come in and he said, what the hell did you do? And I asked him, why? What's wrong? He said, no, no, nothing's wrong. But what the hell did you do? Here is your cat's uh, ultrasound last week. They said, frankly, it was the worst one we'd ever seen. And we all talked about what a jerk we thought you were for thinking you're going to take your cat home and heal him with a laser. And he said, this is a week later. You just regenerated 80% of your cat's pancreas. What the heck did you do? And so I told him what I did. So needless to say, next time I went in there, he had signs up all over for laser for pets. And he started doing a lot of laser <laughs> on pets. Um, but so it gets even more amazing. So he said, well, here's the good news. The good news is you're out of the woods of the necrotizing pancreas with this laser. He said, the bad news is your cat's diabetic. So he He's going to need insulin for the rest of his life. It's going to be expensive. He's going to need four units twice a day. And that's going to run you several hundred bucks a month. And with cats, they have to use human insulin for best results. And it only lasts for about a year to two years. And then just the receptor shut down. It doesn't work anymore. And they'll either die uh, from a blood sugar surge or you'll need to put them to sleep. So what I did is I guinea pig my cat again because there's no placebo on the animals so i did my laser on his pancreas every day and what happened was we got to where he started needing less and less insulin every day to where he got down to where eventually he needed about three quarters of a unit usually once a day instead of four four units twice a day and when i'd bring him into the doctor he was always amazed he's like i can't believe how well your cat is doing and he's actually needing less insulin and instead of living only one or two years like he had predicted he lived another six years so he lived to the age of 17. Wow. Yeah. And that, that really made the believer out of me for the lasers. Mm -hmm. Could still be placebo though. Is there any research on this? I mean, I, I yeah. get your, and no, so for everybody listening, I'm just playing the, the reality. Play devil's is, advocate. Mm -hmm. there, there is, or at this point, there's literally, this is an actual number. There's literally over 5,000 studies mm -hmm. uh, showing benefits of uh, what's called low-level light therapy, low-level laser therapy, or photobiomodulation using especially red and near-infrared light. Um, and that's actually 5,000 studies just on red and near-infrared. There's right. hundreds or, or maybe thousands on other wavelengths of light to treat, for example, skin conditions. But red right. and near-infrared light on all kinds of conditions from arthritis to fat loss to neurological mm -hmm. disease, to Absolutely. depression, to um, enhancing sports performance, and many, mm -hmm. many others. Exactly. Yeah. And we've replicated this time and time again. I'm a big fan of when I have patients coming in whenever possible to get labs on them and to do pre and post labs. And so, as you mentioned, like even for fat loss, I have a, uh, I have a fat loss laser in my office and I had a patient who came in who he was 318 pounds at the time. And he'd been one of these guys who never wanted to change his diet, 
didn't want to exercise, uh, but when he'd gone to the doctor, his uh, A1C was at 10.7 and it scared the crap out of him. So he was willing to try to do some other things to try to change it. And um, because she said, we gotta, you, you got to go on metformin. You also got to have probably insulin. His fasting glucose was in the 300s. His cholesterol was in the 300s and his good cholesterol was low. Liver enzymes were elevated, et cetera. So he had run labs at his medical doctor's office. Then he came in and we did just uh, just a month's worth. It was like four laser sessions, which he dropped a good amount of fat, but he came in excited because he told me, and I don't recommend this. I really recommend people change their diet completely, get on exercises too, but this guy was really resistant to things. He really only did the laser and then cut out sodas. And in a month later, he comes back in, he told me that his MD was blown away at his follow-up lab work and said, what are you doing? Because she said diet and the medications won't cause a drop this low because his, his triglycerides dropped from 2086 down to under 160 and his cholesterol Wait, dropped two, from 2000? 2000. Yes. I didn't it even was, know they go that high. I didn't either. And it even said on his lab report that they had run it multiple times to make sure it was not a lab error. So wow. yeah, it was 2000. His cholesterol was like 320 something. That dropped down to total cholesterol dropped down to like 180. His good cholesterol doubled. <clears throat> His A1C went from 10.7 down to 7. So we know that's huge for his brain, for his neurons, for his you know, organs, et cetera. And his fasting glucose dropped from the 300s down to like 118. So it was amazing change. His MD actually said, you know what? Keep doing the laser. She said, I've never seen a change like that. So it's exciting when you get that now spreading to allopathic physicians because you can't argue with the, with the blood results when you see that. Absolutely. Yeah, and as you're talking about all the studies, that's where I wanted to move into the next section here was as you mentioned stuff with Isabella Wentz, is there's some great studies on <clears throat> lasers for thyroid. And really a big way I got into this was back in 2011, my wife had a severe autoimmune reaction uh, to an iodine contrast that ramped up. I talked with Atis about this because nobody could help us. And he said that that um, intravenous iodine just triggered and ramped up her autoimmunity. And she was really suffering very badly to where at some points we weren't sure she was going to make it. And with Datis's help, and also I, I went, took her to see Datis, and we also uh, – I did some things with laser. I discussed this with Tatis about it, and he shared with me some of the research on lasers for the brain and laser for other things. We started doing some protocols on my wife, and I found these their studies by Hoffling for actually helping patients with uh, autoimmune Hashimoto's of it being able to, to dampen the antibodies that are present in autoimmune um, uh, thyroiditis, Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. And a lot of people don't know that those TPO antibodies also affect the brain and damage the cerebellum. And so what we've been doing in my clinic is these patients who have um, Hashimoto's is even though laser is not FDA cleared to treat uh, Hashimoto's, we help to support them with their symptoms. And we'll do laser uh, near the thyroid and we'll do laser uh, transcranially to try to dampen those antibodies and try to support uh, nerve regeneration in the brain. And we see a lot of really great improvements with these patients who have, you know, um, brain fog uh, or have different cerebellar issues related to what was going on with the thyroid. We've seen patients as we co-manage with their medical doctors actually need less medication over time. And that's what the Hoffling study showed was improved uh, visualization of the thyroid on ultrasound and improved blood flow and a decreased need for medications. And those are fantastic studies available on PubMed. He's been doing some wonderful research on that. Now, when we look at that, a lot of people say, well, how exactly do the lasers impact thyroid function? So one of the things they do, and and reason why I mentioned thyroid and the energy summit is, well, what's the basic master gland for, you know, for, for your energy production? And the thyroid is really important for that. So we can support the thyroid with doing lasers. And the, one of the key things, though, is you don't want to go with a really, according to the research I've read, and I'm sure you've seen the same, Ari, is you don't want to go with the high-powered thermal lasers when we're doing it transcranially or over the, uh, over the thyroid. There are some, you know, some negative studies on that. So you want to do something a little more gentle on there. But we've seen decrease in the antibodies. You see stimulation of glutathione, which helps to dampen inflammation, improve vascularization. <clears throat> One of the key things in these studies I've seen is modulation of the immune system. Like you see dampening of interleukin-6, which we see talked about a lot right now with COVID, how that cytokine storm gets ramped up. And we'll get into the immune aspects of lasers in just a minute. Uh, but we see the lasers kind of dampening that, dampening nuclear factor kappa beta. You're going to improve blood flow by stimulating nitric oxide. You're going to calm down autoimmunity in the brain by uh, modulating the activity of glial cells, which if your viewers have watched the movie Concussion, those are the 
the guys that get activated in the brain and they sit in place and start chomping up the tissue and destroying it. And that was one of the things that T shared with me clear back in 2011 were the studies on using lasers to modulate those glial cells in the brain, which are absolutely amazing on there. And so when we think in terms of that, we think in terms that you can, you can modulate inflammation, you can stimulate brain-derived neurotrophic factor, vascular endothelial growth factor, hepatocyte growth factors for the liver, you can stimulate stem cells. That's where you see that laser can have these really global effects, whether you're looking at someone who has um, an illness or an autoimmune condition or an injury, or I'll show you some, some uh, slides here with some of my uh, champion athletes and what we do just to maximize their sports performance. So I, what I want to skip through on my slide here is lasers for immune support and decreasing inflammation. I know, Ari, right, you just shared some great studies too online the other day about this. And first thing here is my slide that uh, your viewers will see on Niels Ryberg Finson, who won his, uh, the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. But there are some recent studies talking about what blue and violet light can do, like there's a new proof of concept in viral inactivation. This is a study from Food and Environmental Virology from 2017, talking about how you can use 405 nanometer uh, blue light against the feline Khaleesi virus, and also for norovirus decontamination. And what I find really interesting in some of these studies is that when they do the laser or the light on uh, living tissue is that a lower dose is needed versus if you're trying to decontaminate an inanimate surface. So that's kind of exciting there. Um, uh, on, a, on a personal yeah. note, I'll mention, yeah. I got norovirus mm. uh, maybe four months ago, five months ago. Yeah. And it is brutal. For, it's, it's actually what most people refer to as the stomach flu. Yeah. Um, and, and so there's actually no such thing as the stomach flu for people, for people listening. Uh, right. what, you, what you've had, if you've had that, is the norovirus. And it really mimics kind of the symptoms of food poisoning. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of throwing up and diarrhea and like just wipes you out, you know, and you're just exhausted. So I, w I wish I had some of these uh, violet light lasers. When yeah, I got that. Def I mean, that, that's what I have right now at home. You know, we're, I'm out here in California and we're, we're really, everything's really locked down here. So I have lasers with me at home and I have one laser that's a combination red and violet. So I do a protocol where I shine it onto my tonsils. I follow some of the Russian studies on doing it over the thymus and then I sweep the gut. And you know, a lot of people will say, well, yeah, it doesn't penetrate to the gut, which is true, but we see we get this photobiomodulatory effect where you're changing some of these different cellular responses and you can, you can uh, have this antimicrobial effect. And that's one of my secret weapons for trying to keep myself healthy with this, especially when we look at this one study that came out, it's actually six years ago on low level laser therapy, attenuating this myeloperoxidase activity and these inflammatory inflammatory mediators in lung inflammation. Um, and they found, what's really cool is they found that lower doses work great. Like if you clock in at around one, one joule, which is a low dose, you get a really beneficial effect where it, it decreases that in, interleukin-6 that's related to the complications with, uh, with COVID. And it has a positive impact on, on the uh, on like interleukin-10, which is really exciting and with no side effects. Quick question for you. Yeah. This one's interesting, obviously, in the sense that uh, it modulated lung inflammation specifically, which yeah. is a concern with, with COVID. Yeah. Um, do you know if they were using this laser specifically on the lungs, like if they were shining it there or if, if yeah. there, this was a systemic effect from you know, modulating uh, right. cytokines and, and immune cells in the bloodstream? In this particular study, and it's from Journals and Lasers, Journal of Lasers and Medicine and Science, they did use it directly over the lungs. However, I have to say it was on mice, so you are going to have you know less tissue in between there. But they did right. it on mice in that manner. So yes, that was directly to the to the lung area. Got it. Now I do have a um, I do have two little case studies I want to share with you, kind of relating to this. So my first experience with this, I didn't get a, a violet uh, laser in my office until 2008. That was when my clinic was getting busy enough from having a single laser as my reputation was spreading that I traded in my single laser to get what we call a base station, which has three lasers in there, and one of them had a violet and red combination. And uh, at that time, my sister just happened to come down with MRSA, and she had it really bad to where she had a six inch lesion on her thigh that was not responding to the antibiotics and they were getting ready to put her in the hospital and she was really freaked out about that because you know as it streaks of hits the abdomen you can be in real trouble 
So she asked me, she said, hey, do you think there's anything you can do with your lasers to help this out? And I said, well, you know what? I've never tried it on somebody for this, but I know they showed us a study, uh, several studies actually, on violet lasers and violet light for MRSA and saying it had up to a 92% effectiveness in some of these antibiotic resistant cases. Now, again, it's not FDA cleared for that, but these are off label uses, but that's what the research is showing. So I had her come in again, guinea pig my family, and I got the laser on her. And within a few treatments, that six inch lesion shrunk to three inches. After a few more treatments, it shrunk to one inch. And then it went down and was gone within just a few weeks of treatments on there. Came back about 30 days later, a little bit. We did one more treatment, knocked it out. And she actually hasn't had it since. And she used to struggle with some recurrent kind of staph infections. And that really knocked it out. So it was, that really was, was a cool thing to see change on my sister where you could see the lesion shrinking literally as she was leaving from the office. Now, the next slide that I have is going, or case study is going to particularly pertain to what's going on with people's lungs. So I have this one patient named Jane, and she had heard me talking on, a, uh, on one of the thyroid podcasts, actually. And so she was desperate. This was another Obi-Wan Kenobi moment. She was diagnosed with idiopathic heart failure. She had been on meds for eight years and hadn't had any improvements. She was seeing her cardiologist, and she was on eight different medications. And get this, Ari, she showed me her EOBs of what the what the insurance was paying out for these meds, not just what they were billing, but what they were receiving. It was in the early stages was um, over a quarter of a million dollars per year that was being paid up for these meds to where last year it was $424,000 and for eight medications. And I asked her, I said, have you gotten any improvements from it? She said, no, I haven't. So she comes into my office. Uh, and I told her, I can't guarantee anything. This is kind of an off-label use. I'm going to do the laser on you. And I used a three diode laser where I have lasers that watch you rotate around so we can hit the carotid and over the lung fields and also transcranially at the same time. And I also got an extra laser on her, on her foot, which I'll explain that why we did that uh, in just a moment. And I told her, we're going to try this. You come back in two days and you tell me if you think it was worth it or, or not, if you think we did anything different. So she came in, her pulse ox was down in the 80s, really low. She had to come in with oxygen, an oxygen tank. She had to use the um, elevator. She was only in her 50s and she was a lean uh, lady and she had been active beforehand. And she, had, she couldn't wear a shoe on her right foot because it was so swollen. And it had been that swollen for eight years. And um, so she comes in, I get the lasers on her. And she comes back two days later and I ask her, well, what do you think? What happened? Any changes? And she lifts up her foot and she says, look, I'm able to wear an actual shoe for the first time in eight years. Because when she came in, she was just wearing one of those hospital kind of Velcro straps because it was so swollen, she couldn't get a shoe on. And she was really excited about that. After a couple more weeks of treating her, we saw her, she came in excited with her pulse oxygenation uh, sensor. And she said, look at this, I'm actually in the mid 90s for the first time in eight years, instead of being in the 80s for all these years. Um, and she was actually able to go without having oxygen uh, for, for several days even. She continued to get better and better to where literally six months later, she had an evaluation at her cardiologist. Now, initially too, let me backtrack. Initially when she had these improvements, she told me that she was really excited to share it, her improvements with her cardiologist because she was actually now able to go shopping and walk and not have to get the little little cart. Um, and I told her, I said, well, look, you got to understand your cardiologist is probably not going to be for this because it's, uh, you know, it's an off-label use. He's not going to know what it's doing. And she said, sure enough, when she goes there and she told him that within 24 hours of getting a laser on her that that swelling went down, he said, oh, no, no, that, well, the medications finally kicked in. And she said, Doc, you haven't changed my medications in a year and you've had me on them for eight years. How can you say that it's finally the medications when it was literally 24 hours within doing the laser? Are you telling me that's just a coincidence? And that's what he stuck by initially. She would come in for you know, supportive care somewhere about twice uh, a month to see me for about eight minute sessions we would do. And after six months, she did the follow up with a cardiologist and he ran stress tests and imaging and everything. And he came out and told her, uh, he, he asked her, well, I have your results and I want to ask you a question. Are you still seeing that crazy laser doctor? And she said, yeah, why do you ask? And he said, well, look, he said, um, I don't have an explanation for it, but before you started your cardiac function uh, was down at 50% of normal and it's now at hundred percent of normal and I can start winging off some of these medications. So he said, I don't know how that laser worked, but I recommend you continue doing it. And that was an exciting one because here was someone who she had trouble breathing. Her oxygenation rate was really low and we were able to see it that when we do the laser, you would see her oxygenation rate improve. Wow. Yeah. So very exciting stuff there. 
Uh, next one I want to talk about then here is let's talk about, there's a lot of people who are probably interested in this. Well, hey, great for some of these things like autoimmunity or, or diseases. What about sports performance? And this is like, this is really my passion. I work with a lot of athletes. I played high school and college football had a ton of injuries, ton of concussions. And as you know, athletes are always looking for how they can enhance their performance. And an interesting thing about this is the doctor who trained me was actually Lance Armstrong's personal chiropractor when he won all those Tour de France victories. And we know oh, that Lance, that? Uh, Jeff Spencer. Yes, Jeff Spencer. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. I, I met him a couple of years ago and was, had some interesting conversations. Yeah, amazing guy. Just a wealth of information. I really credit. He's a big reason why I am where I am today was just learning from him and following him around. And, you know, Lance did whatever he could to win. And one of the things he did was laser every, you know, while he's on the Tour de France before and afterwards, before to enhance performance, afterwards to enhance recovery. So they were really pioneering this, you know, 20 years ago and seeing the benefits with it. So I took what I learned from Dr. Spencer and started using it with high school athletes. But I came across several studies supporting this. And there is one, you've probably already seen this, Ari, but it was in the Journal of Biophotonics from 2016 uh, in December. Uh, and Hamblin was one of the authors on it. And it talked about the doing preconditioning, so doing laser or photobiomodulation before exercise and also after it can increase sports performance in athletes. And they're talking about like the fatigue, number of repetitions, torque, hypertrophy. They've seen improved muscle mass gained after training, decreased inflammation and oxidative stress. And what I find really exciting, and this is what I share with all my athletes and the coaches, like out here in California, Southern California, we have a hotbed of some of the top um, base baseball players in the nation for these travel teams. And so we work with a lot of these pitchers on a regular basis to enhance their throwing or to enhance their batting. We'll actually do the laser laser transcranially and have them do tracking exercises with a, a mock ball to get those neural pathways to fire better. And we see them improve in their batting average and more home runs, et cetera. But going back to this study, the exciting thing is they actually said that the results on the lasered athletes was as if they had had performance enhancing drugs and they considered it to be an unfair advantage against non-lasered athletes. And they said, you know, we're not sure this should be allowed in international competition like the Olympics because of this unfair advantage. And what athlete isn't looking for an unfair advantage that doesn't, you know, give them a side effect. Mm -hmm. So as a result of like, as word spread, kind of what I was doing with these athletes, I got to work with the Dodgers and Angels fantasy camp, which is really exciting to work with, you know, MVPs and World Series champions and to work on them, even older guys. And I had one particular um, guy who uh, he's the strength and conditioning coordinator for the Chicago White Sox, who he came in one day when I was in the training room and it's funny, I'm in there and you have these trainers who'd been with the Dodgers for 25 years. And one guy had been with the Rangers for a long time. And I come up with my lasers and of course, you know, locker room, it's rough talk. They're harassing me a little bit. Say, hey, what do you got there, doc? What kind of voodoo is that? Well, the amazing thing is as I worked on this one, uh, um, uh, this one coach, he came in because he wasn't able to throw anymore that week. I did the laser on him and he gets up. And he's like, oh my God, I feel like I could go throw a double header right now. And he said his arm hadn't felt that good since he back in his playing days. And so as word spread around that week, I ended up having a line of, of athletes like for an hour long in the morning and then an hour during lunch and an hour after we were done to where everybody was coming to see me. And meanwhile, the trainers, unfortunately, it was like they were in a time warp. It was like it's still 1974. They're still over there using outdated methods. And they'd seen what I had done all week with people with hamstring strains who, are, who weren't batting right, who weren't throwing right. And we'd use the laser and enhance their performance. And the unfortunate thing is they were still doubting Tom is I talked with the one guy who'd been with the Dodgers for 25 years and I asked him, hey, you saw what we did with lasers all week. Do you think you'll add it back in with, with, with your teams you're working with? And he looks at me, he's like, nah, I think it basically does the same thing as when, um, you know, when I'm rubbing on a muscle. There's no difference between a laser and just myofascial techniques. And I was really disappointed at that because I thought, you know, with working on pros, you would see more use of technology, especially ones that have great research behind it. But we didn't really see that. So. As we look at, I've got some other athletes here too, like one kid uh, who played with Vanderbilt University and they won the College World Series last year. And one of the things he talked about is that when he'd get an injury is that he felt like he could recover about 50% quicker. And there are studies that actually show that, that the recovery time when you get a um, laser or, or photobiomodulation therapy on a sports injury or an auto, auto accident, you're looking at recovery times that are usually about 25 to 35% faster minimum. And I'm seeing it usually more in the 50% range. I'll have kids come in who I had one pitcher. He's now at USC. When he was in high school, he stepped on first base 
rolled his ankle. It swelled up. His trainers looked at him. This was as they're getting ready to go into the playoffs. And he said, uh, the trainers are saying, oh man, you're done for the playoffs. You're not going to be able to play. And he's like, no, no, no. I'm going to go to Dr. Gary. He's going to get his, his lasers on me. I'll be fine. Literally he got in there that same day. We got the laser on him, started decreasing the swelling and the inflammation. He was back pitching the next week in, in, uh, in the playoffs and he did well. And then goes on and has a scholarship. I think one of my most, um, Favorite stu studies, though, with, uh, with athletes comes with this kid that you'll see in the slides, Zach Shinnick. So Zach was one of the top runners in the 400 meters in high school when he came to see me. And he had this chronic hamstring strain. Nobody was able to fix it. His mom's a physical therapist. He'd gone to other chiropractors. Nothing was working. He kept getting this chronic strain. And he comes to me in the middle of his senior season. And his parents are saying, man, you know what? We're thinking of just shutting him down. He's already secured a scholarship to USC. Do you think you can get him back? And I said, yeah, I think I can with my lasers and I do a unique thing where we're going to go through and try to recalibrate his nervous system to try to get the cerebellum functioning better to use the laser to reset those nerve pathways. And so Zach comes in and I tested him out. He had strong muscles, but when I put him in different running positions, his muscles would blow out. So what we would do is we'd get the laser on him while he's doing different, uh, uh, like uh, gait patterns to kind of reset, recalibrate that pathway. And while he's doing specific muscle exercises, we had the laser over the muscles that were involved and also transcranially. And what was really cool with Zach is we got him back, instead of him scrapping his senior season, we got him back in to where he ends up uh, winning his league he wins his, his conference title. He wins a state title. He wins a national title. He ran the fastest time in the, in the 400 meters that year. And the key thing is he ran faster than he ever had before to where when he was interviewed on TV, they were actually asking him, hey, what, what, what happened? How'd you come back from an injury and run even faster than you ever had before? And it was the things we were doing with lasers that helped him. And the fantastic thing that really excited me, Ari, was to watch this kid who looked like his senior season was scrapped. And we know, unfortunately, a lot of high school seniors and college seniors right now are having their season scrapped because of COVID is he was able to get back out there and then he actually qualified for the Pan Am games, the junior games, went down there and he won a bronze in his individual meet and a gold medal in the four by 400 meters and they set a world record and they've since broke it a couple more times at USC. So I, I just love those stories of seeing an athlete's performance change thanks to the laser. Absolutely. Uh, all right, so this leads me to one of my favorite things to talk about, which is lasers for brain health. And there was a fantastic book uh, written in 2015. It was a uh, New York Times bestseller by Norman Doidge called The Brain's Way of Healing. Had you checked that out, Ari? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I loved in chapter four, he talks about rewiring a brain with light mm -hmm. and how he envisions a future where, you know, emergency rooms have lasers and light therapy in there to get it on people as soon as possible following a, a traumatic brain injury. This is near and dear to my heart because I had at least a, at least a dozen concussions from playing football back in the 80s, back when you'd get a concussion and they'd send you back in. They're like, just rub some dirt on it. You'll be fine. I remember being on the sideline once and getting hit so hard that they held up two fingers and I saw four, but it was a playoff game so they're like send it back in the backup quarterback's terrible we were not going to win the game without him <laughs> so i went in there i was having some of the symptoms of cte to where i was having some of the depression some of the just feeling of, of disconnect emotionally and uh it was really concerning me before i got lasers and so i actually used the lasers on myself to enhance my brain function and it was actually affecting my practice early on to where i just couldn't get things together because I couldn't be motivated. I couldn't focus on things. And lasers really changed that for me. There's no way I'd be able to travel across the U.S. and teach laser therapy to other doctors and write a 480 page slide manual for the doctors without lasers. So one of the things people don't know is all the things it does. There's a great slide in here from Hamlin called Shining a Light on the Head, photobiomodulation for brain disorders. And that's where he shows all the different things that occur when you get a laser on there, like increased blood flow, increased lymphatic drainage, decreased edema, stimulation of new blood vessels, decreased neuronic cytotoxicity, anti-inflammation. You get things like brain-derived neurotrophic factor, just so many great things. Uh, new synapse formation, a lot of great things, and without many side effects on there, as long as you don't you know, put too much power in there. There are naysayers who say, well, you know, laser can't, or, or, or um, LEDs can't penetrate the skull, which, I mean, definitely you're gonna get some blockage from the, um, 
from the cranium, but there's a really cool study that was just done on autism, a quadruple blind one, that has been submitted to the FDA to be reviewed pending a clearance for treatment of autistic kids. And they did functional MRIs pre and post doing the laser therapy on there. And you can see changes in, in blood flow and neuronal activation, giving you an idea that the laser has had an impact actually in what's going on in the brain. Hamblin even talks about certain studies where they've done laser, I'm sure you've read them, doing laser on the tibia, and you have this global kind of effect to where you're still seeing changes in their ability to, to learn a maze and to have spatial awareness, even if it's not directly applied. And we know the blood vessels can carry some of that as well, too. There's also one study, I don't, I don't know if you've, you've seen it, but it's, um, they've actually quantified the percentage of light that is able to penetrate through the, the cranium bones. Yeah. Yeah. So, and they, they have shown that some, it's a small portion of light because right. cranium is a very thick bone. So, exactly. but there is actually a small portion of light that gets through the bone directly into the brain tissue. Yeah, I know the one that I read was showing, depending on where you put it, between 1% and, and 11% roughly on there. Yeah. That's still and, and more of of And more near-infrared wavelengths, you know, in the, in the 800, 900 nanometer range rather than the red. Yeah. And well, one of the things I do also to get around that is we go up through the sinus cavity or in the open mouth too. That's another thing that we'll, we'll do uh, on there. Um, a cool thing that Dr. Karajian shared with me was this Harvard research showing about these. Did you see it on the tubules that are connecting the stem cells in the cranium to the surface of the brain? No, I haven't seen that. So that just got me thinking. I don't have any proof of this, but we know that lasers and, and uh, light therapy has an impact on mesenchymal stem cells. And the calavaria is rich with mesenchymal stem cells. So one of my things of thinking is another aspect of how this could be working is that we're stimulating these stem cells, these newly discovered tubules that were just discovered a little over a year ago by the Harvard study. I'll send it to you so you can cool. take a look at it. Um, th it says that they will transport stem cells to the surface of the brain to try to get that brain tissue to heal. So really exciting stuff with that. I, I want to kind of bring things to a close with my most exciting brain case that I have. And this is actually um, my office manager's brother. He had a traumatic brain injury when he was less than a year old to where uh, a City of LA worker was drunk and high and drove his city vehicle through the wall of their babysitter's house and hit him and her while they were just little kids on a couch. And Brian suffered these traumatic brain injuries, had had multiple surgeries. Initially, he was blind and lost his hearing. And and uh, they recommended just harvesting his organs, actually. But uh, his mom really wanted to try to do everything she could to save him, like I did with my, with my cat, Poopsie. And so she worked really hard to save him. He had a lot of surgeries and therapies, and he was able to live. But he was stunted developmentally with his brain function. He had a lot of paralysis on the left side. They said um, developmentally he was stuck around the age of 10 years old. And they called him his, their yes man to where if they asked him, hey, Brian, what do you want to do for your birthday? I don't care. Uh, what, do, what do you want to eat? I don't care. He, he didn't have any opinion on things. So my office manager had seen all the things we were able to do with patients over the years. And she's like, hey, do you think you can work with my brother Brian? I'm like, I don't know. It's been 30 years since he had the injury. That's a long time. He, I don't know if we're going to be able to do anything, but it can't hurt to try. Let's bring him in. So we brought him in. We started doing some transcranial laser therapy. I did use an actual red laser on that one, 635 nanometers on there. And while I was doing it, I was trying to stimulate different nerve pathways. He'd been going through therapy and got some movement back, but I would have him do like assisted movements with his arm. I would have him try to do, follow me with cardinal fields of gaze. I would try to stimulate different inputs in his brain to get those neuron pathways to fire. What was fascinating with him was when he first started, he could not move his eyes to the left at all. They would just, we do cardinal fields of gaze, he'd go to the right, but nothing to the left. After a couple of weeks of doing laser, all of a sudden, boop, he had a little blip out to the sides. As we continued doing these exercises, it got stronger to where he could look and he could hold it. As we did this and as his brain started getting better, they started noticing that he used to walk in a crooked line. He could now walk in a straight line. They also said it was like his brain was waking up because he started to give opinions on where he wanted to go, what he wanted to do. He would say no, like he went through the terrible twos. And he started using his hand for things he hadn't done before, like to open up bags or open up bottles. But they said the most amazing thing came with his most recent birthday, when he asked his mom, he said, hey, mom, my birthday's coming, right? And she said he normally would never have any comprehension of that. And she said, yeah, why? He said, well, look, for my birthday this year, I want a taco caterer, I want a magician, and I want you to get these five friends. This one, you've got to ask this person to, to, for permission to come. This one, you're going to have to bring because no one can bring him. And they were amazed at the complexity of his thought that he was able to do. Even his neurologist asked, what are you guys doing with Brian? Because he's been at this this baseline for decades and now all of a sudden he said the same thing it's like his brain is is waking up and it's continued to get better to where most recent thing with him was he was able to watch his dad 
get up and his dad does uh, like has a real physical job so he has a lot of pain watch his dad get up and make all this noise and walk across the floor he was able to watch that realize it was funny figure out how to imitate his dad's voice and the way he walked and show it to his family to add that uh you know he could do an impression and he never had done that before how far is it going to go with him i don't know but the cool thing is he's getting better there's been no side effects that's one of the things i love about lasers and light therapy beautiful so quick question for you yeah um Obviously, you're you're talking about lasers here. I'm I'm yep. going to do a, a separate presentation in this summit for talking about really the same subject of photobiomodulation, red and urine right. for light therapy, um, from a very different angle than you, uh, yep. which is, you know, I'm it. I'll be really heavy on the study, not uh, real heavy on the case reports, like right. like you are because you're you're a clinician, yep. um, which I think is a, an amazing perspective to bring into this. And you, of course, you brought in a number of studies as well. Um, the challenge for people listening is just like, okay, well, how do I do this laser stuff at home? Exactly. And right. so, right. Um, you know, I think basically the big takeaway from this is to make people aware that this right. technology exists and that there right. are practitioners like yourself that have the ability to help with a wide variety of different conditions exactly. using this pretty miraculous technology. And, right. and so, you know, if you're listening to this and you have some of these symptoms that Dr. Gare has mentioned, uh, seek out a practitioner. If you're in the San Diego area, then seek out, you know, Dr. Gare uh, directly. Um, but do, do you have any thoughts on, you know, kind of what, what I was just getting at there? Yeah, no, I totally agree with you because I always, you know, especially when I have complicated patients coming in. Obviously, they can't be in my office every day. I have the luxury of having lasers at home with me all the time, but they are a higher price tag. So I definitely recommend, uh, and you'll know more on what devices are good for home use with me because that's your your area. I know which ones are great for doctors to use in a clinical type of setting that has the FDA clearances for, for them for liability issues and whatnot. It's, it's worth mentioning, sorry to interject, it's just yeah, worth mentioning for people that, you know, lasers are generally like at least I think four or five grand at uh, least, and, yeah. And, and, you know, up to 20, 30 grand, maybe more than that. So, I've got some that are 50,000 in my office. Yeah, like right. the fat reducing one is really expensive. The, right. the one that has the three diodes that I use for, like for Brian or for, for Jane, that one's like a $40,000 laser, you know. So mm -hmm. it just, it depends. But for home use, yeah. I have patients who will get different things at home to keep them going. And so they got something going on a daily basis. I mean, shoot, we know if patients go out in sunlight, I mean, that's a huge one. I have some friends who are from, um, from, from Norway and they were telling me about how basically they have two days a year because they're so far north they've got like day and night i said what's that like he said well in the winter everybody's really depressed and uh we drink lots of vodka we sleep all, all the time and we get nothing done i said what's it like in the summer he said well the sun's out so we're happy so we sleep a few hours a night we do all of our work for that summertime on there so we know the power of light all these different forms of light have uh, have value on there it's just you know uh it's it's i i really recommend people to have things also to do at home to help them on a regular basis. And I think that's what Dr. Deutsch talks about. I know you've shared that with your listeners as well. And I think that's the future. I think if people had more of these devices at home right now during this pandemic, you know, we wouldn't see as many of these cytokine storms because they'd be able to get things on them on a daily basis. 100%. Yeah, I agree. And I agree also that sunlight will approximate uh, at least some portion of the right. same benefits mm -hmm. for most contexts. Mm -hmm. Um you know, uh, there are some cases where if you're shining a light, you know, like up the nose or you're shining yep. a light, you know, in the back of the throat or something like that, uh, using a laser, you might not get the same effect or even, right. a, a, you know, anywhere close to the same magnitude uh, yeah, from sunlight. Exactly. But I do That's think still. sunlight can give a lot of the same benefits. And you are, you know, it's important to understand, I think, red and your infrared light therapy in the context of, mm -hmm. you know, human beings existing in sunlight and evolving to uh, to utilize the red and exactly. infrared rays of sunlight mm -hmm. and some of the other bioactive wavelengths mm -hmm. um, to our advantage and that mm -hmm. they perform, they, they interact with our cells and have all of these amazing effects. And I think you're doing really innovative stuff with that. And thank you so much for, for sharing all of your knowledge and, you know, all of these different, you know, miracle stories of, of patients that you've treated. So really Thanks a pleasure talking me. to you, my friend.
Pleasure being here. Absolutely. Thanks for yeah. doing this work. It's great to share all that with uh, people who need it out there. So I appreciate everything you're doing. Yeah. Thanks so much, my friend. Okay, to everybody listening, hope you enjoyed this and I will see you in the next one. Hey there, this is Ari again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you found it valuable, please share it with your friends, share it with your family, help me get the word out there. Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell to get notifications every time we release a new video or new episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for supporting my work at the Energy Blueprint. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next one.